Chapter 8 Stewardess Pam Miss Travers smiled at Ricky's fear that he had damaged the airliner. No, she said, smiling. We're going down because we'll land at that airport you see ahead. To get my banana? Sue asked impishly. The stewardess laughed and said the little girl would have to wait and see. They would be picking up their supper. Watch for a little cart, she advised. It contains the hot food we're going to eat after we take off again. Again, the seatbelt sign flashed and the plane banked toward the runway. After making a smooth landing, it taxied to the main building. The Hollister children looked eagerly for the cart. Pam was the first to spy a little truck speeding toward them. Painted on the side was J.B. Smith, caterer. The driver stopped the truck alongside the landing platform and carried several metal containers onto the plane. While he was doing this, a motor-driven fuel wagon pulled up and filled the plane's tanks. Then two more passengers got aboard and soon the airliner roared off into the sky again. As soon as Pam had unfastened her seatbelt, she walked back to talk to the stewardesses. A minute later, her family was startled to hear her voice over the loudspeaker. This is Pam Hollister, speaking for stewardesses Traver and Gilpin. We welcome you to flight 224 and hope you will be comfortable. Dinner will be served shortly. If there is anything special you wish, please press your seat buzzer. Hooray for Pam, Sue said in a loud whisper to her brothers. She's a good play stewardess. The older girl came back to her seat a moment later, smiling broadly. They said I could help out while they were preparing the trays, she said. In a few minutes, Miss Traver walked down the aisle, carrying a tray which she put in Pam's lap. Then she and Miss Gilpin served all the other passengers one by one. On the trays were hot meat and vegetables, and for dessert, there was gelatin. But Sue got a special surprise. In the middle of her plate, Miss Trevor had placed a fat yellow banana. Goody, she exclaimed. You got it when we went downstairs. After supper, the hostesses tilted the children's chairs back, and they napped while the sky grew darker. Four hours later, the plane banked as the pilot prepared to land again. We're getting off here, Mr. Hollister said, as he roused his sleepy-eyed children. After they had said goodbye to Miss Gilpin and Miss Traver, the children walked out. Mr. Hollister called a cab, and they were driven to a nearby motel for the night. After breakfast next morning, Pete asked about the car in which they would continue their journey. At this moment, a tall, sunburned young man in tight-fitting blue jeans entered the motel and asked for Mr. Hollister. He was directed to their apartment and said he had a car for him to rent. We couldn't find a seven passenger car for you, Mr. Hollister, the man said, so we're renting you an air conditioned school bus. We don't use it in the summer. A school bus, the children chorused. The young man pointed to the parking area where the bus stood under a tree. Yikes, Ricky clicked his heels and the children ran pell-mell toward the bus. This is a yummy game, Sue giggled, as she hopped in and flopped onto one of the leather seats. Mrs. Hollister stepped aboard next, with the children following her. Dad, you're the bus driver, Pete exclaimed, and here's a cap you can wear. He reached behind a sunshield and pulled out a khaki-colored cap, which he gave to his father. Holly giggled when he put it on. Let's each give Daddy a penny for our fare, she suggested. Each child did this. Then a porter came with their baggage on a hand truck. When it was stowed in the back of the bus, Mr. Hollister announced, All aboard! Away we go to Yumatown land! He drove from the motel along a broad highway that stretched like a ribbon across the sandy desert country. Mr. Hollister asked his family to close all the windows, and then he turned on the air conditioner. In a few moments, the bus became comfortably cool. This is very pleasant, Mrs. Hollister commented, looking out the window at the countryside. 
Giant saguaro cactus plants grew alongside the road, holding up their arms as if greeting the visitors. Pam said she had learned something about cactus plants in school. I think that big one up ahead, she said, pointing, is the barrel cactus, and there's water in the thick stems. It's said Indians used to drink it when they were lost in the desert. After driving all morning, Mr. Hollister stopped at a roadside stand for refreshment and then started off again. How different the country began to look after that. From the flat, arid desert, they climbed into a range of hills. The vegetation became greener as they went higher, and soon they came to a cool climate in the pine-covered hills. There's a big sign up ahead, Pete remarked presently. I wonder what it says. Mr. Hollister stepped on the brake so they could read it. The sign stated that the area ahead was a national park and that visitors were welcome. There was an inn for guests. And dancing bears, Pam cried as she finished reading the sign. Oh, please let's stay overnight, Holly begged. I've never seen bears dance. Mr. Hollister looked at his road map, then agreed. We could never make the Yumatan Pueblo today, we may as well stay here. The road gradually wound up a long hill. At the top was the inn. It was built in Spanish adobe style and sprawled over a half acre of ground. Beautiful pine trees bordered the hotel and to one side was an immense cage with several brown bears in it. Oh, let's make them dance, Sue begged. While Mr. Hollister went to ask about rooms, the children ran to the cage. A guard standing there smiled. You've just come, he asked. Yes, Pete answered. When do you have the show? Anytime, the man answered. I'll give you one now. He opened a large wooden box nailed to a tree. Inside was a record machine, which began to play. In a moment, one of the bears reared up on its hind legs and turned round and round. That's Sally the man said. Now watch Billy and Tilly. Two bears stood up facing each other and put their front paws on each other's shoulders. Then they lifted each hind leg in turn, keeping time to the music. Oh, aren't they funny, Pam laughed. Ricky and Holly began to jump around, imitating the bears. When the music stopped and the animals did somersaults, the children fell to the ground and flopped over too. Mrs. Hollister called them to come, so they hurried to the inn. How attractive the Spanish and wildlife decorations were. Ricky was particularly interested in a large mountain lion rug in the, hall, in the hallway. As he was stroking its head, Mr. Hollister said, did you hear about the entertainment surprise for children tonight? No, what is it? Storytelling by an old cowpoke named Cactus Charlie Sounds swell, Ricky said. After supper, all the children at the inn seated themselves cross-legged on the floor of the lounge before a roaring blaze in the fireplace. As Pete chatted with a boy named Jack, he noticed that Ricky had not yet arrived, but he forgot about this when Cactus Charlie appeared. From his ten gallon hat to his silver spurs, Cactus was Pete's idea of a genuine cowboy. He swaggered before the fireplace as the children clapped and said, Hi, partners. Would you like to hear about the time I chased Big Chief Bullhorn or about when I captured the giant mountain lion single-handed? The mountain lion, the children shouted. Okay. Cactus pulled a three-legged stool from beside the fireplace and sat down on it. As the children listened intently, he told of a giant beast that had frightened a herd of cattle and made off with several calves. The puma, that's the same critter, left tracks the size of saddlebags, Cactus drawled, and might still be roaming the range today if I hadn't stopped and battled the brute single-handed. The cowboy told his wide-eyed listeners how he had trailed the mountain lion and cornered him in a cave. I looked him straight in the eyes, Cactus said. Suddenly, Holly screamed and pointed to something moving in the flickering shadows. 
a huge puma head appeared and a deep growl filled the lounge. The boys shouted and the girls cried out in fright. Even Cactus' eyes popped and he fell off the stool. As the hotel manager came running, the mountain lion stood up straight and Ricky's face popped out from beneath the skin. Ha ha, fooled you, didn't I? He chuckled. The children laughed and Cactus admitted it was the best trick that had ever been played on him. You sure scared me, he grinned. Ricky put the skin back where he'd found it and the storytelling continued until bedtime. Next morning, Pam asked her mother's permission to shake, to take a short walk before starting their ride to the Yumatan Pueblo. I want to look around and then feed the dancing bears, she said. Mrs. Hollister said all the children but Sue might go. Pam stopped to buy a bag of popcorn. Then the four children set off through the woods of pine and aspen trees toward a canyon a girl had told Pam about. Reaching it, they gazed in delight. How lovely the colors looked, the sun shining on the tops of a distant mesa. After looking at the view a while, they turned back. The boys ran on ahead and soon were out of sight. Pam and Holly strolled along slowly. Hearing a sound behind them, they turned. Not far from them was a big bear. The girls were so frightened that they could not move. Oh, Pam, what'll we do? Holly whispered to her sister. Let's run. Suddenly, the animal reared up on his hind feet and walked quickly toward them. 